good morning, everybody. Um, and let me start with uh, saying that I'm delighted to have a new buddy. Um, and uh, <laughs> the new buddy is Howard. And I'm, uh, after this morning, I'm absolutely yeah, certain that uh, the two of us can cooperate. And I have more than one reason for that, Howard, if you allow me to say so. Uh, it's a bit private, but <laughs> Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Schmidt is um, a, for, well, her ancestors were Dutch, and uh, that is the good and direct. <laughs> <laughs> so even if I have my hesitation with Howard, I know now who is by this, so that is <laughs> Okay, and having said that, um, and that is also a personal and um, uh, a bit uh, perhaps emotional uh, remark that I want to make. Always when I'm uh, visiting the United States, and that's quite often for my children, what I was mentioning, are US citizens and living here with my grandchildren and so on. But having said that, um, it is indeed um, for me a country that I owe. And uh, I need to explain that a little bit. I was born in World War II, so I can't remember the World War in itself only the liberation, and that was great. U.S. Uh, military people came over, and uh, as a very small child, I got my <coughs> first chewing gum. But later on, I uh, indeed got the explanation of my parents that without the U.S. and without the Canadians, we wouldn't have been free country. And uh, all in all, and that is what is the start for me to be so dedicated to uh, Europe, um, it is indeed one of those issues where, with the experience of wars and with the experience of fights and what have you, the founding fathers of Europe started in the 50s uh, in taking an initiative and owing also the respect uh, to uh, all those people who were sending their young sons, so to say, to make it possible that they took that initiative it is a complicated story, but it isn't complicated. You gave us an opportunity to be uh, on a continent with our own uh, freedom and when uh, the founders of Europe <coughs> took the initiative in the 50s, six founders, by the way, uh, all men, uh, women were at home at that time, so that in the meantime has been changed a bit, but not enough, uh, so we still have to fight for it. But having said that, that was the start of Europe. So I uh, owe the United States of America a lot, and I'm not the only one. 500 million people in Europe are really uh, uh, owing you a lot. Having said that, um, when you are mentioning, uh, Vicky, that um, you want to hear something about uh, the group, I abuse your invitation. I will touch upon a little bit more, so to say, and starting that indeed this portfolio is quite, and Peter was mentioning it, is quite a bit different from the former one. And I'm always saying it is, of course, a pleasure and a yeah, honor to get a second opportunity in life uh, and just serve Europe again. But with this portfolio, people were saying, my goodness, it's great that you are reappointed. And some were saying, it's not great at all, but that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> that former client, so to say. But having said that, um, it is great that you are reappointed, but who are you with this point of view? And I said to my people, for Lorena is joining me again at this scene, uh, I said to my people, let them just think that it is a portfolio that is not making sense, and we will deliver within a short period of time that it is the most creative and the most innovative and out-of-the-box thinking portfolio. But, by the way, that it is so close to the people that it is so close to citizens and that it can really make him a difference. And that was what the president had in mind when he just created this portfolio. That it really makes sense to think of an instrument in which you can just push economic growth, that you also can push social uh, aspects and that you can push welfare and so on and so forth. What I wasn't aware when I took this portfolio, or only a slight, bit of it was the issue that we are discussing today, for it, that it was so close to cybersecurity and that it was so close to cybercrime 
and that it was so close to if you are not acting at the right moment, at the right time, so to say, then you are losing ground, or then you are losing trust. And it's all about trust. It's not only about trust in Europe, it's trust all over the place, the globe, so to say. So it's great to have this opportunity and to discuss with you the network and information security, and we just call them cyber security. So a lot of communication is needed, perhaps not in Washington, perhaps <coughs> not in a part of the United States, but all <coughs> over the world, I think, we need to communicate far more that we are not accepting unsecurity in the cyber world, so to say. And nowadays, uh, who is denying that our societies, prosperity, and many aspects of our day-to-day -day life depend upon the unimpeded functioning of the internet and other IT networks. Cyber incidents, be they the result of technical failure or of deliberate hacking, may cause major, major economic and social damage. <coughs> Perhaps some numbers can help to get the picture quite clear. The OECD estimates that US businesses alone are losing around 70 million billion uh, US dollars on a yearly basis because of malware, not to mention the cost and the hazard of for uh, individuals. In Europe, a recent survey showed that looking at the past five years, 78% of all EU internet users had security problems, and 65% reported being victim of spam. And almost one in two, <coughs> by 46%, detected viruses in the computer. Many reports show that problems relate, related to cybercrime are growing across the board. Financial fraud, malware infection, <coughs> password sniffing, website defacement, denials of service attacks, which have now entered into everyday parties after the radio saga. Take also the discovery of Stuxnet earlier this year. The risk of an attack against critical infrastructure is no longer a, fic a fictional scenario or a horror movie. Uh, the movie is not anymore a movie, it is reality. And <coughs> the threat is real. But while the threat is growing, we sometimes fail to see who is behind it and indeed understand and their true motivations. Who understand them? We all know how difficult it is to attribute responsibility when it comes to cyber space. Too often, we do not have the right tools to find the originators of an attack. Sometimes, we do not have appropriate laws in place either. Take, for instance, what is happening with WikiLeaks and what lessons can be drawn. In my view, we should well distinguish between <coughs> three security incidents. And having said that, I think that the first incident was the leakage of sensitive information from the IT systems of the US State Department. That was allegedly done by an insider. I shall not comment on the judicial proceedings, but from a cyber security angle, this highlights the need for all organizations and individuals to protect against <coughs> threats to steal confidential information. In parallel, we should also ensure that we, as governments, public administrations, are as transparent and open as possible. And I think that is an important value but it also has a major practical advantage. It reduces the amount of information that requires special protection. And the second incident was the interruption of domain name and other web service provision for WikiLeaks. Was there a violation of the terms of service by the various involved providers? Was the fact that those providers operated across various regions of the world and therefore under different policy and regulations of cloud computing, any relevant to their decision? 
When problems arise with globally distributed services, all private operators and public authorities should be able to act with some legal certainty. And the third incident was the so-called <coughs> hacktivist attacks, both against and then in support of WikiLeaks. The rocket called Jester mounted the denial of service attack against the WikiLeaks website. And later, in support of WikiLeaks, the group Anonymous distributed a software to mount distributed denial of service attacks against Visa, against paper, and government sites. Those incidents also highlight the following issues. The number of computers used in the attacks was apparently relatively small. A few hundreds, also some figures reported in the press, claimed over six times as many. That, ladies and gentlemen, raises the question of the reliability of the information circulating about cyber attacks. It also tells us that such attacks can be organized by just a few. However, the victim services have also proved the white robust or agile, which demonstrates the resilience of the cloud architectures we have in place. And finally, also the LOIC software shares features with botnets. The key fact is that the PC owners have voluntarily made their computers part of a coordinated action. And those issues are for all of us to examine. In my mind, this series of events obliges public and private operators to find solutions together and to anticipate rather than react after the facts and in the heat of the moment. This is not an online game. What is at stake here is whether people and businesses on both sides of the Atlantic will continue to use and trust the internet and have confidence in this integrity. In Europe, my colleague, the European Commissioner for Home Affairs, has tabled a piece of legislation on attacks against information systems. And as a result, those who send up botnets, for instance, will be subject to heavier panel, uh, panel sanctions. We also work to render justice and police cooperation in this area more effective. For instance, I'm particularly horrified by the ease with which children abuse images can be exploited online. Last weekend, and I was mentioning <coughs> Yet another case was discovered thanks to a close cooperation between the US and the Dutch authorities. And it's essential that we do more to prevent such exploitation and crimes. There is no excuse for taking a month to remove a Fedofila uh, website when uh, phishing websites are generally removed within hours of their detection. We are taking steps to improve this. My department in commission runs a safer internet program that supports hotlines for the public to report illegal content. We also fund an international network of hotlines called In Hope with members in Europe, but also in Asia, in Canada, in the United States, <coughs> and Cyber Turkey, uh, which is run by the US National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. From January 2011, we intend to promote systemic and fast notification of ISPs by the European hotlines in an agreed procedure with law enforcement agencies. On the cybersecurity front, I've also made proposals to modernize EMISA, the European Network Security Agency, and that agency helps the EU, its member states, and the private stakeholder to deal with cybersecurity challenges modeled on the US cyber storm simulation exercises, we are carrying out 10 European exercises. And we will keep working with the US to align our plans. And of course, then the question is raised, is it enough? I don't believe so. We can do a 
and looked more to minimize the disruptions on our networks, notably by working together in private and public sectors, the EU, the US, and other countries. And that is the <coughs> message I have come over to convey to the US government and to you in the private sector. By working together, we can dramatically improve our capability to prevent, to detect, and respond to cyber security problems. Partnerships are the way forward, and there is no alternative when the effects of cyber disruption generated in one part of the world can be readily, easily, and heavily felt in all parts of the world and in all sectors. And that fact makes a very welcome the creation, and now I'm coming to the point, last month of the new EU-US Working Group on Cybersecurity and Cybercrime. I've come over to Washington to discuss the agenda of this newly enhanced operation with my bunny, if you allow me to say so. Mm -hmm. And I will pursue the dialogue next year with Jeanette Napolitano, and we will do it together with the three of us. In the year to come, the Working Group will focus on four priority areas that are of direct relevance to cyber security. Number one, cyber incident management. Number two, awareness raising. And number three, cyber crime. And number four, the public-private partnerships. Let me stress once again, ladies and gentlemen, the importance I give to this latter dimension. Unless we involve the expertise of the private sector that owns or controls a majority of our ICT infrastructure, we, as public authorities, simply cannot fully exercise our responsibilities. Together, we must build a true risk management culture. What do I mean by that? Well, first, we need wider circles of trusted parties. And the existing circles, so far, are too narrow. So, to start with all the main network players, should make available the wealth of data they have on security incidents and their impact. And we should also be able to measure for our businesses, NGOs, and our government <coughs> the cost of <coughs> countermeasure and mitigation strategies. And we must also turn this wealth of data into globally shared ICT risk management standards and practices. And second, I would like to see the ICT sector as a whole, on both sides of the Atlantic, develop and promote sound security practices, guidelines and standards to enhance the quality of software and hardware systems. We are not starting from scratch, so to say. Many companies do already use security as a competitive advantage. But I also think that too often some important players in the sector accept the existence of insecure products from the market. In short, I would like to see full commitment of the whole ICT sector to security, and not as an at home, but as a true design principle underlying all your businesses and technological processes from the outset. Security by design just like the other side of the coin, I mean privacy by design, should go hand in hand. And those who see these as a mere additional cost are, in my opinion, short-sighted. Today, it's already a competitive advantage, and tomorrow it will be a necessary requirement for when you bank account, your health records, your rights and duties as a citizen will be fully dependent on IT. IT systems. No individual or organization will want to buy or use IT products and services that do not have the highest security and privacy standards. And third, and that is linked, we therefore need to identify what key assets, what resources and functions are necessary to ensure the continuity of vital ICT services. We also need to develop common mechanisms 
and transatlantic networks to prevent, to mitigate, and react to large-scale cyber attacks and cyber disruptions, such as botnets and distributed denial of service attacks. Ladies and gentlemen, just concluding, and I'm paraphrasing a U.S. president, cyberspace is the new frontier of our times, and it is an uncharted area full of <coughs> yet unknown threats, but also of more opportunities to come. And it is our duty to explore it. And I believe that together, the US and Europe, both their public and private sector, can make it our collective success. Thank you.